All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so um, I hope everyone felt okay about the exams from Tuesday. Um, and the people did pretty well on this exam, so I was, I was very happy with that. Uh, so I believe the average was somewhere around the 90% or so, somewhere around that kind of ballpark. So that was uh, really good, really good. So pat on the back to you guys for that. Um, so today we're going to start a completely new unit, um, and we're going to be looking at uh, the genome, and we're going to be looking at reproduction. Um, so before we go forward here, um, there's one question I wanted to ask you guys before we get started. So um, in the past, we've talked about uh, four types of biological molecules. Um, what were those biological molecules? So one of them was proteins. What else did we have? Anybody, anybody, anybody. So lipids, yeah, so Tim said lipids. So proteins and lipids, cool. What's one more or two more? Carbohydrates, absolutely. And then there was one other one. Anyone remember? Nucleic acids, right. So we had, uh, we had lipids, we had carbohydrates, we had proteins, and we had nucleic acids. So for the first half of the semester, um, we pretty much talked about three of the four. I'll kind of just write them up right here. Okay. So we talked about proteins, we talked about lipids, we talked about carbohydrates, uh, and then we have nucleic acids as well. So these first three, we spent the first half of the semester talking about. So proteins, we were looking at in the context of looking at enzymes. With lipids, we were looking at the plasma membrane and different components of the plasma membrane. Um, and the last one, we were looking at carbohydrates um, like glucose and how they're able to, um, to make ATP. Okay. Um, so everyone's able to see the PowerPoint, right? Yeah, okay, cool. All right, yeah, so we talked about these first three. We talked enzymes um, in terms of proteins, lipids in terms of the plasma membrane, carbohydrates in terms of making ATP, and how, how all, all of those can be used in food to help us make energy as well. Okay. The one that we didn't talk about uh, as much or pretty much at all was the nucleic acids. Uh, and so nucleic acids are gonna essentially form the basis from now to the end of the semester. So we're gonna be mainly focusing on those nucleic acids. Uh, does anyone remember what those two types of nucleic acids are? Anyone remember? Yeah, Paul. Is it uh, DNA and RNA? DNA and RNA, absolutely. So those are the two types of nucleic acids we're going to have. And these are going to form the basis for the rest of the semester. So we're going to be talking about, um, to, to various degrees, how different types of reproduction. Okay. And that's going to be where DNA is going to be coming into play here. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and clear out of that. Cool. Okay. So DNA and RNA essentially help us with um, repli or, sorry, reproduction. Um, and so we can have reproduction in one of two um one or two kind of standpoints here. The first type of reproduction is one that we're pretty familiar with, and that's how you know we're able to you know take mom and dad and end up producing an offspring okay, uh, through that process. Um, so that's one type of reproduction. The second type of reproduction that we may not necessarily think of as um, often is reproduction of our own body cells. Okay? So for example, um, let's just say uh, you know we were we get a cut, right? Let's say we get a cut. And what we need to do is we need to repair that cut. So we're going to start producing extra skin cells to help fix that, fix up that cut. Okay. So we need different parts of our body to be able to reproduce in order to help us repair, as well as a few other things, and we'll talk about those. Um, and then we also need reproduction 
um, in order to help us produce offspring as well. Okay, so we have two types of reproduction and we're gonna be focusing on those for the rest of the semester from here on out. Okay. Um, now, regardless of which type of reproduction we're gonna be doing, reproduction is gonna be happening um, through what's called the cell cycle. Okay. Um, and so what's gonna happen is we're gonna start off with a single parent cell, as we see over here. And through re this reproduction process, we're going to end up forming two new daughter cells. Okay. And then once these daughter cells begin to grow, they're eventually going to be able to reproduce themselves as well. Okay. Um, and so regardless of, again, whether you're looking at replication or rep reproduction of your own body cells or reproduction to form an offspring, it's always gonna be running through this same similar pathway. Okay. If we're trying to reproduce a skin cell, okay, we're gonna end up reproducing and we're gonna end up with two total skin cells. If we're trying to produce an offspring, we're gonna end up with one single, um, one single zygote, which is an offspring, the initial cell of the offspring when the sperm and the egg fuse. And then from there, that'll start to undergo reproduction to help form more cells from there. Okay. So that is reproduction. That's kind of where we're going for the rest of the semester here. Okay. So um, in order for ha to have reproduction, there's going to be one of those nucleic acids that's going to play a very, a very vital role. Okay, that one is going to be DNA. Okay, and so when we're looking at an organism's or a cell's genome, okay, a genome is the total amount of DNA that is found within that particular organism. Okay. And so the genome is going to look a, a little bit different in prokaryotes versus in eukaryotes. Okay. So in prokaryotes, the genome is going to be double-stranded, just like any other DNA would be, okay, like, we, uh, like we probably know from high school. We're going to have a double helix uh, for our DNA, and it's going to be arranged in a loop. Okay, in a circular loop for prokaryotes. Okay. Now, because prokaryotes do not have any membrane-bound organelles, they're not going to have a nucleus. Okay, that's going to contain their, their DNA. Okay, so for that reason, the, the prokaryotes DNA is going to be found in a region of that prokaryotic cell called the nucleoid. Okay. So the nucleoid is not a physical structure. It's uh, just a space in the middle of the prokaryote. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be where the DNA is going to be found. So prokaryotes are going to have a circular DNA that's going to be found inside the uh, inside the nucleoid. In eukaryotes, like humans and animals, this is going to look a, a lot different. Okay, so in eukaryotes, the DNA is still going to be double stranded, okay? but instead of being organized circularly, okay, it's going to be organized more linearly. Okay? So you're going to have these two strands of DNA, okay, one going this way and one going this way. And so that entire DNA molecule is going to be wrapped around some proteins, um, and that is going to form a structure called the chromosome. Okay. And so the chromosome is going to be your, your set of DNA, um, all kind of wrapped around some proteins to help it be compact. Okay. Um, and so when we're looking at this chromosome, each of the chromosomes, uh, all of your DNA essentially, is going to be found inside the nucleus, okay. um, which is going to be that membrane-bound organelle where the DNA is, is but that's going to contain your DNA. Okay. And each species is going to have a specific number of chromosomes. Okay. So for example, humans have a total of 23 chromosomes. Okay. okay. So when we're looking at a set of, of uh, chromosomes, okay, we're going to use the letter N to represent a single set of chromosomes. Okay. So when we're looking at our normal body cells, so for example, like our eye cells or skin cells, muscle cells, um, uh, nerve cells, okay? Those are all cells that are called somatic cells. Those are your normal body cells. Those cells are going to have two sets of chromosomes, okay? Um, so, for example, like we said, we have 23 chromosomes. So those cells are going to have two sets of them. So you're going to have one set of chromosome one, one set of chromosome two, okay? Or we can have, you know, one set of chromosome two and then a second set of chromosome two, okay? Or, you know, one set of chromosome uh, seven, another set of chromosome seven, okay? So we're going to have two sets of chromosomes in all of our normal body cells. And so that's going to give us a total of 46 total chromosomes in our somatic cells. Okay. Uh, the other type of cell that we can have in our bodies is called a gamete. So our sex cells. Okay. Those are the sperm and the egg. Okay. The sperm and the egg are called the gametes. And so those, are, those ones are going to be considered haploid. Okay. Or they're just going to be uh, labeled as just one N, whereas diploid is going to be two N. Um, so gametes are going to have just one single set of each chromosome, so they're going to have just a total of 23 chromosomes. Okay. Uh, and so where this comes into play here 
is when we have a sperm cell, um, uh, let's see. So when we have a sperm cell, here's our sperm cell, okay. and an egg cell, okay. each of these is going to have 23 chromosomes. So during sexual reproduction, okay, when these guys fuse, they end up forming an offspring with a total of 46 chromosomes. Okay. So your entire somatic cells, okay, the entirety of your somatic cells are gonna have 46 chromosomes. And that's gonna be because one set of chromosomes came from mom and the other set of chromosomes came from dad. And we'll talk more about that um, when we get into uh, more sexual reproduction when we talk about meiosis in chapter seven. Okay, is everyone following me so far? Any questions here? Okay. Cool. So let me go ahead and clear this out. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool, yeah, cool, yeah. Okay. So those are our chromosomes. Okay. Now when we're looking at those pairs of chromosomes, okay, each pair is referred to as a as homologous chromosomes. Okay. So if we look at this kind of picture here up at the top, we're gonna see our chromosomes and they're going to be arranged pretty much in pairs. Okay. So these are these pairs is what we refer to as homologous chromosomes. And those homologous chromosomes are gonna come, again, one from mom and one from dad. And each homologous chromosome is gonna be about the same length. Okay. So as we see over here, we're gonna have one set of chromosomes. Here's another set of chromosomes before they end up replicating. So this would be one pair of homologous chromosomes. Okay. When they eventually replicate, okay, now we have, again, uh, they've replicated their DNA. Now, we, again, we still have one pair of homologous chromosomes here. So when we're looking at each individual chromosome, okay, from a homologous pair, each chromosome is going to contain a specific, or is going to contain specific genes on it. Okay? Genes are just regions of your um, DNA sequences. Okay? They're just regions of nucleotide segments inside your DNA. Okay? Um, so here, for example, this would be, this pink region would be one gene. Okay? This blue region would be another gene. This pink region here would be another gene. Okay? So genes are just regions on your DNA. Uh, and they're always going to be found in a certain location on your chromosome. So that location is what we refer to as a locus. Okay. So again, if we look at these homologous chromosomes over here, we're going to have the R gene on one chromosome and then the R gene on the other chromosome. Okay. So these would be the same gene. Okay. Here we have the P gene okay, on this chromosome. Here we have the A gene, B gene, and then the C gene. Okay. So genes, like I said, are just regions on that particular chromosome, okay? Regions of your DNA on your chromosome, okay? Now what's important about genes is that they're going to determine every single characteristic about you, okay? Um, so they're gonna determine everything from your eye color to your, uh, to your hair texture, your hair color. They're gonna determine your personality or um, your temperament. They're gonna determine various different things about you. And the, re the way those genes are going to be able to determine those various characteristics is each gene is going to code for a specific protein. Okay? And that protein will then determine or will then uh, produce that particular characteristic that you're, you're looking at here. Okay? Um, and so uh, just to kind of give an example here, everyone will have the same gene for eye color. Okay? Or the, the, it's going to be the same region on your DNA. So my gene for eye color is gonna be the same place where we're gonna have Tim's gene for eye color and Alan's gene for eye color and Deja and Ryan. They were all gonna have the same gene for eye color. It's gonna be that same region of DNA. Okay. However, obviously we know, you know, my eye color is gonna be different from Ryan's and Ryan's is gonna be different from Tim's and Tim's is gonna be different from Jack's. Okay. So the reason we have all of those different changes is because the DNA sequences in those particular genes okay, are gonna be different from person to person. So again, everyone's got the same gene. Everyone's going to have the same region of DNA that's going to code for eye color. Okay? But the DNA sequences, okay, the nucleotides in that particular gene are going to be different from person to person. And so as a result, you're going to end up getting some variation in, what, in people's eye color. So some people might have a DNA sequence in their eye color gene that gives them blue eyes. Some are going to have a DNA sequence in their uh, gene for eye color that gives them brown eyes and then green eyes, um, hazel eyes, and so on and so forth. Okay? So traits uh, are just different forms of that particular characteristic. Okay? In this case, the characteristic would be eye color. Okay? 
the traits would be, you know, the specific eye color you have. So brown eyes versus blue eyes versus green eyes or hazel eyes and so on and so forth. Okay. Does that make sense? This is kind of a, a, a point that's going to be important going on for the rest of the semester here. Are there any questions here? Okay. So if not, we'll go ahead and keep going here. Okay. Okay. So now moving into um, kind of looking into more in depth about these homologous chromosomes. So like we said, each pair of homologous chromosomes is going to come from a different parent. Okay. So one of these homologous chromosomes is going to come from mom. The other homologous chromosome is going to come from dad. Okay. Because each chromosome is coming from mom and dad, there's a very high chance that those chromosomes are not going to be identical. And again, that's going to play a role um, later when we get into reproduction. Okay. Um, and so because these chromosomes are not going to be identical, okay, uh, there's going to be a variation in the, indiv the total individuals of species, okay, uh, of a particular species. So I'm going to look a lot different from Josie, and Josie's going to look different from Ryan, and Ryan's going to look different from Tim. Okay. So everyone's going to look different because they're all inheriting different traits and different genes from parents. Okay. And they're going to end up getting a different complement of um, genes that they're going to inherit, and that's going to cause uh, different variations uh, from person to person, okay, or, or organism to organism. Okay. Okay, so an example of that is when we're looking at blood types, okay. So some people might be type A blood, some people might be, might have uh, type B blood, um, some people might be type O blood, okay, or type AB blood, and so on and so forth. Blood types are actually inherited from your parents as well. Okay. So here's an example. So for example, um, let's say your father has uh, passes down the A uh, version of the blood type uh, gene. Okay. And then your mom also passes down, let's say she passed down the B uh, gene. Okay. When they form that offspring, okay, when they form you, they're going to end up, or you are going to end up being type AB blood because you're going to inherit the A from your dad and the B from your mom. Um, another example would be maybe if your dad passes down an O and your mom passes down an A, okay, you're going to end up having type A blood because the O just doesn't really count here. Okay? Or if both your parents pass down the uh, O uh, version, you're going to end up having type O blood. Okay? So blood types are going to be found on uh, a particular sequence on your DNA, a particular gene. Okay? And that gene is going to be inherited uh, from your parents. And so that is going to determine your own blood type and your own characteristics and your own trait. Uh, where does the positive uh, or so negative? That's going to be an example of different types. Yeah, so where does the positive or negative come, uh, come into play? So the positive or negative also comes into play, but it's a separate gene. Okay? It's a completely separate protein that codes for that gene. Uh, but it works exactly the same way. Okay, so for example, if your dad passes down the, the positive gene and your mom passes down the negative gene, Okay, you may end up getting either one, um, but most likely you'll take on the positive. Okay, both parents pass on the positive, you'll be positive. If both parents take, pass on the negative, you'll end up being negative. Uh, so again, it just, it depends. It exactly works, as, uh, it works exactly the same way, uh, but it's uh, just a separate protein and a separate gene here. Um, yeah, so that kind of goes back to Yeti's question too. Okay, cool. Yeah, so to answer Yeti's question, um, Yeti's question is about the Rh factor in blood. So the Rh factor is uh, the uh, the positive or negative component of the blood. Cool. All right. Any other questions here? Okay. Cool. All right. So this is going to be the case for all of your somatic cells. Okay. And so, so for example, in somatic cells. Um, they're all going to have genes that are in the same locations or the same loci. Um, the exception to that rule is going to be the sex chromosome, so the X and the Y chromosomes. Okay. Uh, males, sorry, females are going to have two X chromosomes. Males are going to have an X and a Y chromosome. Okay. The thing about the X and the Y chromosome is that they are not identical in any way. Okay. So here we have a, a copy or an image of the X chromosome here. Here we have an image of the Y chromosome. Um, and as we can see, they look very different. Okay, the X is much larger, much larger than the Y, and they're going to have a separate set of chromosomes. Um, and so one thing that's kind of interesting here about the X and the Y chromosomes is that the X chromosome actually has a lot of different genes 
that are crucial to survival. Okay, um, the Y chromosome doesn't really have a ton of important stuff. It does determine your sex. Uh, your sex, obviously, um, it's going to determine a few other things, but the X chromosome is going to be important because that's going to give you everything you essentially need to live. Uh, so the X and the Y chromosomes are not going to be identical. And in fact, another kind of hypothesis about the X and the Y chromosomes is that the Y chromosome, which we see over here, uh, is obviously significantly smaller. And it actually looks like over time, according to some scientists, that the Y chromosome has actually been shrinking over time. Okay? And so the hypothesis, you don't need to worry about this. This is not you know, part of anything important here. But part of the hypothesis is that because the Y chromosome is progressively getting smaller and smaller, there may come a point in time where the Y chromosome just ceases to exist altogether. Um, and so all that will end up with is just X chromosomes. So whether that's gonna end up happening or not remains to be seen. Um, this, like I said, is just a hypothesis that you know, may potentially be happening here. Um, but again, the, the key here is that the X and the Y chromosomes are not identical. So they're not going to have the same genes in the same locations. They're gonna have a completely separate set of genes here. Cool. Yeah, Paul. So that means that uh, men would go extinct? Yeah, effectively, if that, were, if that hypothesis does come true, it seems like men would probably go extinct. And so uh, it would kind of become a situation where it's like, who run the world? Girls, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, that may be what ends up happening if that actually does you know, end up taking place. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, cool. All right, so that is going to bring us to the cell cycle. Okay, so the cell cycle is going to be part of chapter 6.2. And so this is going to be a very, very important uh, set of events here. Okay? And so before we get into the, the specifics of the cell cycle, I'm going to kind of talk about its importance here. So this cell cycle is going to be important for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, basically what the cell cycle's job is to do is it's going to produce genetically identical daughter cells. Okay? The reason for that is because you want to do two things. Okay? Number one, you want to be able to grow, and then you also need to be able to repair yourself as well. Okay? So for example, when we think about you know, how small we were when we were baby, we were probably about you know, a foot in length, maybe you know, seven, eight pounds or so. Okay? We were extremely small when we were babies. Okay? But as we get older, Okay, eventually we're gonna start growing okay, until we get to our current size, which is obviously not the size we were when we came out of our mom's womb. Okay? And so we had to grow. Okay? The reason we were able to grow so, uh, to, to such a, a, a huge degree is because our cells were able to reproduce. Okay? Our own normal body cells, our, our somatic cells, were able to reproduce over time. Okay? And so you end up having one cell that eventually replicated and ended up with two cells. And then now you have two cells that ended up replicating and forming four cells then four cells eventually become eight and so on and so forth until we eventually grow to be the size that we are. Okay, so that's the rule number one of the cell cycle, okay, helping us to be able to grow, okay. Rule number two is it's going to help with repair, okay. So for example, if I'm, if, you know, Paul's my brother, for example, and I'm really upset with Paul, you know, I, I'm just, just angry, okay, I might go over and I just, you know, cut his arm, okay. Well, his arm's gonna start to bleed, right, because I just cut a hole in his skin. So as he starts to bleeding, he's eventually not going to bleed out, okay? And the reason he's not going to bleed out is eventually, be, uh, over time, the skin cells are going to start to repair themselves, okay? They're going to start replicating and reproducing to form new skin cells, okay, to patch up that wound. Okay? And all of a sudden, now, he's all good to go, okay? So that's the goal of the cell cycle, okay? The goal is to produce genetically identical daughter cells, okay, to help you either grow or repair. So the cell cycle is going to be a series of events that's going to take place over a cell's lifespan. Um, and that's going to be where the cell is going to be able to grow and then eventually divide. Okay? And then the goal, like, the goal, like I said, is to produce two genetically identical daughter cells from an initial parent cell. Okay? That's going to be important because, uh, for example, if you know, we cut our skin, we want to produce genetically identical daughter cells. Okay? Sorry, Paul. <laughs> uh, we want to produce genetically identical daughter cells. So... Uh, we don't want to be producing, you know, for example, eye cells on our arm, okay? Because we, then now we're going to have a, one eye over here, one eye over here, and then a third eye on our arm. We don't want that happening, right? We don't want to be producing different cells where they shouldn't be. We want to be producing genetically identical daughter cells. So we want to have skin cells 
developing from skin cells. We want to have muscle cells developing from muscle cells. We want to have um, eye cells developing from eye cells. Okay, so we want to make sure that the cells that we're producing okay, are genetically identical to the parent cell that produced it. Okay. So in order to do so, there's going to be two different phases or two different uh, kind of, yeah, phases of the cell cycle. Okay. The first phase is called interphase. Okay. And so interphase is where the cell is going to be able to grow okay, and then it's going to replicate its DNA. Okay. Uh, the second phase is the mitotic phase. And so the mitotic phase is going to be where that DNA that we just replicated, um, as well as all of the cytoplasmic contents, the, all the things within the cytoplasm, are going to eventually get separated and then divided into two individual cells. Okay. So to kind of look at this picture over here, uh, our interface is going to be this portion, okay, for starting from here, all the way through this slice of the pie. Okay. So as we see, Interphase is a very long period of time. And in fact, our cells are going to spend the majority of their time in interphase. Okay. Then from there, they're going to spend a very small period of time in the mitotic phase. Okay. So the mitotic phase is a very short period of time where it's actually going to be dividing, okay, but it's going to spend the majority of its time in interphase where it's just going to be uh, growing and then replicating its DNA. Okay. So... When we're looking at the cell cycle, um, the length of the cell cycle is going to change dep on, on, uh, depending on a various, uh, various different factors. Okay? So the first type of factor that's going to determine the length of your cell cycle is the kind of organism that you are. Okay? So some organisms are going to have longer cell cycles within their cells than other ones. Okay? Uh, so you know, it's just, just a difference based off of the type of organism. Okay? Uh, the second thing that can determine the length of your cell cycle uh, actually happens within that particular organism, and that's going to be the type of cell that you're looking at. Okay, so for example, when we're looking at an embryo over here, in a you know a baby that hasn't been born yet, okay, the embryo is going to undergo the cell cycle every few hours, so very very rapidly. Okay? So it's going to be able to produce new cells uh, very very quickly here. Okay, when we look at our epithelial cells, the cells that make up our skin, okay, they're going to undergo the cell cycle every few days. So they're going to be producing new skin cells every uh, every couple of, every two to three days or so. Okay. Then we have other cells like our cardiac muscle cells that will not undergo the cell cycle altogether. Okay, so they're not going to be able to produce any new heart muscle cells. Okay, so all the cells that are inside the heart okay, are going to remain there. They're not going to divide. They're, they're, whatever you have is what you have, and that's it. Okay, they're not going to divide at all. Okay. So depending on the type of cell that you're looking at within an organism we're gonna see different lengths of the cell cycle depending on the type of cell that you're looking at. Okay. The last thing that we're gonna be able to see in terms of the length of time in each phase is going to be uh, the, the, how quickly the, the, the cells are gonna be able to move through various checkpoints during the cell cycle. Okay. So as you move through the cell cycle, at some times you're gonna be moving through it a little bit faster than um, at other times. And that's gonna be because there's gonna be certain checkpoints that your cell has to uh, run through first before I can move into the next phase. Okay. If something's wrong, okay, then it's going to take a little bit more time to fix those um, errors. If everything is fine, it's just going to run straight through into the next component or into the next uh, phase. Okay. So um, we're talking a little bit about those checkpoints in more detail here. So like we, talk, like we said before, whenever we're producing daughter cells, okay, those daughter cells have to be um, exact replicas of the parent cell that we were producing. Okay, so skin cells need to be the same as the skin cells that we just uh, that they came from. Okay, eye cells need to be exactly the same as the eye cells that they came from. Um, so all the cells, all the daughter cells that we're producing, have to be exact duplicates of the parent cell that produced it. Okay, uh, so they have to be genetically identical. However, there are times where um, there can be some errors that take place during the course of the cell cycle. Um, and when those errors happen, okay, uh, if they're not fixed, that can lead to uh, either producing uh, extra chromosomes or not having enough chromosomes. Okay? And so now you end up with having a cell, for example, that ha might have five chromosomes instead of four when it initially started with, okay? or end up with three chromosomes instead of four. Okay? So you end up with different numbers of chromosomes and that leads to mutations okay? when those um, duplication or uh, distribution of chromosomes does not happen appropriately, okay? Um, and so that leads to mutations, okay? And if you have a mutation, some mutations can actually be, be very detrimental to the organism as a whole um, and cause, and some can even be lethal. Okay? And so if you have a mutation that develops that wasn't fixed uh, previously, 
that mutation can then be uh, propagated into the next generation of cells when that cell undergoes cell division. Okay? So if, for example, if you have a cell with a mutation that undergoes division and it produces two new cells that now also have those same mutations, okay? and then and so on and so forth, those cells may also replicate and then end up forming other cells that have mutations. Okay? So we don't want to have that happen because, again, that's going to be producing cells that were genetically different from the parent cell that have initially produced it. So we want to make sure that our cells do not have any errors. Okay? And so that's gonna be the role of these checkpoints. Okay? So if a cell does get compromised in some way, whether it's the DNA or something else going on within the cell, there's three checkpoints during the uh, course of the cell cycle where the cell can assess what's going on. Okay? If everything's okay, it'll run through. But if there's a problem, it'll stop at that particular checkpoint, fix everything, and then move into the next checkpoint. Um, and so the, the, the goal for, or the, I guess the benefits of having those checkpoints is to make sure that if there's a problem, okay, it gets fixed before you move into the next phase okay, and you eliminate the chances of getting a mutation. Okay. So um, there's a total of three checkpoints, like I mentioned. So there's a G1 checkpoint, which is going to happen um, at the end of the G1 phase. Okay. There's another checkpoint at the end of the G2 phase of interphase. Okay. And then there's, there's a third checkpoint in metaphase here. Um, before we go forward here, are there any questions on any of these checkpoints before we get, uh, we're going to explain these checkpoints in more detail as we go forward here, but any questions on the roles of these checkpoints and how we're going to be producing new daughter cells and how we can get these errors? It's all makes sense. Okay. So then, um, yeah. mm -hmm. what? What does it mean? Like, if a, what are you talking about when you say if a cell is compromised? Like, what? I don't understand. Is it? Yeah. So your question is about what, what does it mean if a cell is compromised, right? So yeah. So like, if, if there's a cell a gets compromised. Yeah. So if there's a defect, um, and so we'll talk a little bit more as we kind of go forward here, and uh, we'll look at different things that can be compromised. Uh, but typically, um, the things that are going to be compromised are the DNA. So, for example, if the DNA doesn't get replicated properly and there's a mistake when you uh, replicate your DNA, okay, that would be um, where the cell gets compromised. You're, you're producing DNA that's not correct. Um, or you know, there's some certain things in the cell that should be there that aren't there just yet or aren't there at all. Um, so those would be things that, are, uh, that can compromise the cell. Okay. Okay. So when the cell so runs like through those checkpoints... Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. I just wanted to mention that um, in my other class when we were using Zoom, when you open up the participants window, it, um, it also has these little buttons that say yes or no. And um, it's kind of like the raise hand button. And then that way when you're asking, like, do you understand, like, uh, you can, everyone can just hit this yes. Or if you see a no, you could be like, okay, I'll further explain it. So I guess maybe that's something you could look into, like, in settings or something okay. like that. Okay, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Paul. For sure. Thank you, thank you. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, so that is that. Okay, so, uh, all right, cool. So we're going to go ahead and move forward here. So the first phase of, of the uh, cell cycle is called interphase. Okay, so we're going to run through the entirety of the cell cycle, and we're going to hit those checkpoints as we kind of get there. So we're going to kind of go in kind of a uh, chronological order here. Okay, so we're going to start with interphase. And so interface is uh, the first part of the cell cycle. And so this is going to be where the cell is just undergoing its normal processes and normal functions. Okay? So it's just going to be doing its normal daily activities, um, just kind of chilling, doing, doing its normal thing. Okay? And then it's going to start preparing itself to undergo cell division. Okay? Now, as it starts to prepare itself to undergo cell division, there are certain uh, conditions that have to be met before the cell can move from interface into the mitotic phase. Um, and so there's going to be three stages to interface, and each stage is going to have a certain set of conditions that need to be met at the end of that phase. Okay? So the first phase of interface is the G1 phase, okay? then we have the S phase, and then from there we have the G2 phase. Okay. All right, so the first phase is the G1 phase, okay? and so G1 is also called gap one, um, and so this is where the cell is just growing. Okay? It's not doing a ton, it's just kind of growing, again, going through its normal daily activities. 
um, there's going to be a few changes that are going to be happening within this cell. So you're not really going to see anything different uh, happening there. Um, one thing that we will start to see the cell begin to do is it's going to start to accumulate all the building blocks that are going to be necessary to help build all your chromosomes and help move the chromosomes um, and all of the proteins that are necessary for them. Okay. And then the last thing that it's going to be doing is it's going to start accumulating lots of energy. Okay. And so as it accumulates those energy stores, it's going to be able to have some energy available um, so when the cell does begin to replicate the chromosomes, it has the energy to do so. Okay. So those are the things that are really going to be happening. It's just going to be growing. It's going to be just assembling some uh, certain building blocks um, that are going to be necessary later on, um, and then accumulating some energy um, stores as well. Okay, so that's the first phase. Okay. So at the end of the G1 phase, there's going to be your first checkpoint, okay, which is called the G1 checkpoint, also called the restriction point. So the restriction point is going to be the part of the cell or the part of the cell cycle where the cell is going to become committed to cell division. Okay. Once the cell passes the G1 checkpoint, this is the point of no return. Okay. Once you pass this checkpoint, you are for, that cell is for sure going to start undergoing cell division. Okay. Um, so there's no going back at that point. Okay. So during this checkpoint, the cell is going to be checking for three things. Okay. Number one, it's gonna to check to make sure it has an adequate reserve of energy, adequate energy stores, okay? Number two is it's going to check on the size of the cell and make sure that it's big enough to undergo cell division, okay? And then the third thing that it's gonna do is it's gonna check on the DNA and make sure there's no damage in the DNA. Okay. So if any of those three are not, uh, are any of those three conditions are not met, the cell is gonna stop at the G1 checkpoint and then wait until all of that stuff now happens, okay? It's gonna wait to make sure it has the energy necessary. If the cell's not big enough, um, it's gonna wait until the cell eventually does become big enough, okay? If there's damage to the DNA, it's gonna fix that damage before uh, you move into the next phase, okay? So all of those are going to be things that the cell is gonna be checking for to, uh, before it can then pass that checkpoint, okay? Once all three of these conditions are met, okay, then the cell will then enter the next phase of interphase, which is the S phase. Okay. So the S phase is the second component of interphase. And so during the S phase, this is also called the synthesis phase. Uh, so the S phase is going to be where, where we take our chromatin, which are our initial kind of semi-condensed uh, uh, DNA, okay? And they're going to condense further in, and eventually become chromosomes, okay? So now here we have one chromosome over here and then a second chromosome over here. Okay. Each of these chromosomes during the S phase is going to get replicated. Okay. And so this one leg of the chromosome is gonna replicate itself and now we're going to end up with having two legs of this chromosome. Okay. Same thing with the purple one. Okay, this one is gonna get replicated and so now we're gonna end up with one, two legs of this particular chromosome. Okay. So each of these legs of your chromosome are what we refer to as sister chromatids. So here, we, this is again, the part of biology where we're gonna to start to see similar words that mean different things, okay? So here we have one chromosome and then a second chromosome. Here, this is again, one whole chromosome and then a second chromosome over here, okay? The difference here is that each of these chromosomes on the right now has two sister chromatids, okay? So this would be one sister chromatid, this would be a second sister chromatid. Okay? On the purple, this would be one sister chromatid and then again, a second sister chromatid. Those sister chromatids are going to be attached to each other at a central region on your chromosome, which is called the centromere. Okay. So sister chromatids are gonna be attached at the centromere. All right, so that's that. Okay. The second thing that's gonna be happening here, so in addition to replicating your DNA, we're also going to be replicating our centrosomes. Again, similar word, different meaning here. So the centrosomes are an organelle that's going to um, be able to produce microtubules. And those microtubules, which are you know, an element of your cytoskeleton, are gonna end up forming these structures called mitotic spindles. Okay? And we'll talk more about that in a second here. So here we have our centrosome. Okay? The centrosome within it is gonna have two centrioles within it. Okay? So this would be one centri uh, centriole, this would be another centriole. Okay? And each of those centrioles um, it's going to help produce the microtubules 
that will eventually become your mitotic spindles. Okay. Those mitotic spindles are eventually going to help organize cell division, help kind of facilitate the cell division process. Okay, okay cool. All right, so this is what this whole structure would look like here. Okay, so again, initially we have just one centrosome, or sorry, centrosome. Okay, when the centrosome replicates after uh, the S phase, we're going to end up with two. So here's our second centrosome. Okay, and each centrosome is going to start producing these microtubules, okay, or mitotic spindles over here. Okay? And they're going to be involved with allowing uh, cellular replication to take place for reproduction. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Actually, actually, I kind of, kind of, fun way of going about this. So, if you go to the top, I believe it's on your screen. There's an annotate button. Uh, if this makes sense, go over to stamp and just hit like a heart or a checkpoint, and let me know if that makes sense. If things are still a little confusing, go ahead and hit an X and let me know how we're doing here. Okay. Is everyone okay? So I see some hearts, I see some checks. Okay. All right, cool. So looks like we're doing okay so far. Okay, oops. All right, so that's the first two phases. So we have the G1 phase and then we have the S phase. Okay. After the S phase, we then move into the G2 phase. Okay. So in the G2 phase, okay, the cell is going to start to kind of, again, grow and start to uh, replenish its energy stores. Okay, so it took a little bit of energy to help rep, uh, replicate that DNA. So the energy that it just used up needs to now be replenished so that it can now have the energy to undergo um, the mitotic phase and actually divide. Okay. So it's going to replenish its energy stores and then it's going to continue to grow as well. Okay. Uh, it's also going to begin to build some extra proteins that will be necessary to help move the chromosomes during um, the mitotic phase. Um, also during this phase, there's going to be some organelles that are going to end up getting duplicated as well. Again, to make sure that the two daughter cells will have the appropriate amount of organelles at the end of that whole um, division process. Okay. And then we're going to start breaking down some of our cytoskeleton. Okay. So when we break down some of that cytoskeleton, that's going to provide some resources to help build the mitotic spindles. Okay. Once all this is completed, uh, the G2 phase is going to end when the cell just makes any final preparations that it needs to undergo the mitotic phase. Okay. So again, here, all it's doing is just preparing itself to actually divide, because this is gonna be the last portion of interphase. Okay, so that's the interphase. Okay. At the end of G2, there's going to be a second checkpoint. So in this second checkpoint, one of the things that we're going to be looking for is checking to make sure the cell is an adequate size, and then again, making sure that it has the correct, excuse me, the correct set of proteins in order to help it do, do what it needs to do. Okay. But more importantly, okay, it's going to be checking on two other things. Okay. Number one, it's going to be checking to make sure that all of the chromosomes have been replicated. Okay. All of the chromosomes within your particular nucleus, nucleus need to be replicated. You can't have some being replicated and some not being replicated because then you're going to end up with an uneven number of chromosomes. Okay? And then as a result, your daughter cells are going to look a little bit different from the parent cell. Okay, so all of the chromosomes have to be replicated. Okay? That's number one. Okay, number two is that you need to check to make sure that the DNA that you did replicate is not damaged in any way. Okay, it needs to make sure that there's no errors in the DNA uh, and that all of the DNA looks like it should. Okay, there shouldn't be any errors um, even just a single error, okay, a single nucleotide error, can be detrimental okay, or, or potentially lethal. Okay, so the cell needs to make sure that the DNA that has been replicated is not damaged or um, is built properly. Okay. Okay. Once all three of those, so actually, let me, let me backtrack. So if there's a problem, so if the chromosomes have not been replicated properly, okay, then the cell will kind of go back and make sure that it's all replicated. Okay. Um, if uh, the DNA is damaged, okay, there's a way that the cell can go back and repair that damage, and then all of a sudden now it's good to go. Okay. And then again, if there's you know, an inadequate cell size, it could wait till it becomes a good enough cell size or um, accumulate the, the appropriate proteins. Okay. So once all three of these conditions are met, then the cell is now ready to undergo the mitotic phase. Okay. 
So that is the second of our three checkpoints. Okay. Okay. So um, any questions here? So if there's any questions, or if this makes sense, go ahead and throw a heart or a checkpoint back up there. Uh, if it doesn't, go ahead and put an X, and I can explain this a little bit more in detail here. All right. I see one check. Anybody else? Okay. So I don't see any access, so we're going to go ahead and move forward here. Okay. So the, uh, now that we've finished um, interface, okay, we are now going to enter the mitotic phase. Okay? So the mitotic phase is where the cell will actually begin to divide. Okay? So at this point, again, we have not divided anything. Okay? We're, the cell is still that same initial parent cell that, is, that we started with at the beginning. Okay? No division has taken place. The only thing we've done at this point is prepare the cell to actually begin to divide. So during the mitotic phase, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the nucleus and we're gonna take everything inside the cytoplasm and we're gonna divide that and we're gonna end up forming two individual daughter cells, okay? So uh, there's gonna be two subphases to the mitotic phase. The first phase is called mitosis. Okay? And so in mitosis, we're gonna take all of our chromosomes, we're gonna align them, separate them, and then move them to opposite ends of the cell, okay? Once they get moved to opposite ends of the cell, we're gonna split the cell in half and then now we're going to end up with two daughter cells. Okay. Um, so that's going to be mitosis. Okay. We're just going to be kind of uh, moving the cell to opposite ends, or sorry, moving the chromosomes to opposite ends of the cell. Okay. Um, so that is going to be, take place in four stages. We're going to have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and then telophase. Okay. And we'll look at what all those phases look like. Okay. The last phase is called cytokinesis. Okay. And so cytokinesis is where, um, after we've moved our chromosomes to opposite ends of the cell, that's gonna be where we actually physically separate the two and they actually become two separate daughter cells. So cytokinesis is where we actually split the cell into two and end up with two new daughter cells here. Okay. So we're gonna take a look at the, these steps in, in some detail here. And so we're going to start by looking at prophase. Okay. So prophase is the first phase of mitosis. Okay. And so to begin a uh, prophase, our first goal is to get our nucleus to be as easily accessible as possible. Okay. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to break down the nuclear envelope. Okay. So if you remember, the nucleus is going to have a double membrane surrounding it. Okay. So that's called the nuclear envelope. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of that nuclear envelope. And so um, well, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to break that down. Okay. So instead, we're going to have um, our nucleus, which was over here and no nuclear envelopes around again. Okay. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to break down the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. So if you remember from chapter two, I or maybe uh, beginning of chapter three, uh, all those organelles, okay, the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum, those are very extensive networks of membranes that are gonna be surrounding the nucleus. Okay. And so in order to get access to the nucleus, we need to break down the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum. When we break those down, we're gonna move them out of the way and we're basically gonna move them to the periphery of the cell. Okay. Um, then we have, we're gonna have a third thing that's gonna happen. And so there's gonna be the nucleolus, which is that small little ball inside the nucleus, and that is going to disappear. Okay. So we're gonna break down the nuclear envelopes surrounding the nucleus. We're gonna break down the Golgi and break down the ER, okay, which are again, surround the nucleus as well and move those out of the way. And then the nucleolus inside of the cell is going to disappear as well. Um, the second components that are going to be happening in mitosis is um, we're going to have our microtubules. So if you remember, we just produced our centrosomes during S phase. Okay? Those centrosomes are going to start producing those microtubules, and those microtubules will end up forming these structures here, which are called our mitotic spindles. Okay? Those mitotic spindles are going to continue to grow, and they're going to grow and grow and grow until they eventually push the centrosomes to opposite ends of the cell. So eventually, initially, they were closer together. Okay. When they were closer together, they start producing their microtubules, their mitotic spindles, and that eventually pushes them to opposite poles of the cell here. Okay. Uh, now, those mitotic spindles that develop <clears throat> will end up stretching, um, and they're going to eventually start at attaching to the chromosomes, um, and they're going to connect at a protein on the chromosomes called the kinetochore. Okay. And so that kinetochore is going to be a protein that's going to sit at the centromere of your chromosome, okay, that central portion of your 
chromosome is going to have two kinetic cores, one on either side. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be the attachment point for those microtubules. Okay. And so we'll see where that comes into play in a second here. Okay. The last thing that's going to happen is that our sister chromatids are going to become a lot more visible. Okay. They're going to become more condensed. And when they become more condensed, they're going to become more visible when we're looking at these under a microscope. Okay, so that's prophase. So there's a lot of things happening in prophase. Uh, but essentially in prophase, we're just preparing us to be able to move our chromosomes uh, around. Okay. And again, the key here is that our mitotic spindles are going to begin to attach to the chromosomes at the centromere, specifically at the kinetic core. Okay. Um, the next phase is metaphase. Okay. So in metaphase, uh, we have our uh, mitotic spindles that are mitotic spindles that have attached to our centromeres. Okay? And so what these um, mitotic spindles are going to do is they're going to arrange your chromosomes and they're going to orient them in a single file line in the middle of the cell. Okay? And that is going to be at a region called the metaphase plate. Okay? So the chromosomes are going to align in a single file line along the metaphase plate. And that metaphase plate is going to be basically at the equator of your cell. So the key here, uh, the other thing here that's going to be important is that our sister chromatids on our chromosomes are still going to be attached at this point. Okay? Well, the only thing that's happened is that our mitotic spindles have just moved our chromosomes in a single file line along the metaphase plate. Okay? So here I have a picture of what it looks like under uh, what's called fluorescence microscopy. So in fluorescence microscopy, um, what happens is um, people, will, uh, scientists will dye uh, different aspects of the cell using a fluorescent dye. So here we see um, the chromosomes arranged in blue okay, along the metaphase plate. Okay. These green regions here are the mitotic spindles okay, that have attached to the chromosomes. Okay. So again, they're going to be holding everything along the metaphase plate, holding your chromosomes at the metaphase plate here. Okay. And from there, before we exit my, uh, the metaphase um, section, or the metaphase you know, phase here, we're going to hit our third and final checkpoint. So this third checkpoint is called the M checkpoint, um, or also called the spindle checkpoint. Okay. This, this checkpoint might be the most important of the three because this is going to make sure that all of the sister chromatids and all of your chromosomes have appropriately attached to the mitotic spindles. Okay. If there's any mitotic spindles that have not attached to any um, chromosomes, or maybe they're only attached on one side but not the other, okay, that's going to be a problem because that's going to cause um, a, an inadequate or an inappropriate division of your chromosomes. Okay. And so we want to make sure that all of our chromosomes are attached on both sides okay, on, uh, by the mitotic spindles. Okay. If any of the sister chromatids is not attached to a mitotic spindle, it's going to wait until that particular sister chromatid gets attached. Okay. So all the mitotic spindles must be attached um, to the spindle fibers okay, by the kinetic cores. Okay. So each sister chromatid has a kinetic core. And so each kinetic core needs to be attached to a spindle fiber. Okay. Uh, this is making sense. Go ahead and throw a hard or a checkpoint uh, or an X if that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and move forward here. So that's our third checkpoint. So that's going to be the last checkpoint. Okay. The next. Uh, phase of mitosis, the third phase, is anaphase. Okay. So in anaphase, we're going to end up splitting our sister chromatids and moving them to opposite ends of the cell. Okay. And so the way this is going to look is, for example, here we're going to start by looking in metaphase. And so in metaphase, we have our cells attached at the sister chromatids okay, along the metaphase plate. Okay. In anaphase, what's going to happen is those uh, mitotic spindles are going to pull those chromosomes apart at the centromeres. And so they're going to end up moving each of those sister chromatids to opposite ends of the cell. And they're going to be moved closer to the centrosome um, that they're attached to. Okay. Once they've been separated, each sister chromatid is now referred to as an individual chromosome. Okay. So instead of having, so initially we had four chromosomes, one, two, three, four. Okay. Now we're going to end up having a total of uh, uh, eight here. So one, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight chromosomes. Okay. Now, eventually when this splits, okay, it's going to split in half. And so each cell here, okay, I'm going to kind of draw this out a little bit to kind of help this make a little bit more sense here. 
when the cell eventually splits, it's going to split, oops, ooh, sorry. It's going to split right down the middle here. Okay. And so each cell is going to have one, two, three, four chromosomes, just like the initial cell did. Okay. One, two, three, four. The only difference is that these ones have their DNA replicated while these ones don't. Okay. But that's the, that's the game plan here. Okay. But ultimately, okay, we separate our sister chromatids, and then now uh, we end up forming uh, new, or I guess we end up having with eight chromosomes as opposed to four okay, in this particular case. Okay, so we just split our sister chromatids and moved them to opposite sides of the cell. Okay. So again, if we look at our um, fluorescence microscopy over here, we can see our um, chromosomes being pulled okay, to opposite ends, okay, uh, as well as having our mitotic spindles kind of pulling them to uh, opposite ends of the cell. Okay. And so the cell is going to elongate during this particular phase. Okay. okay, so that's anaphase. Okay. The last phase is called telophase. Okay. And so now that we've pulled our uh, chromosomes to opposite ends of the cell, okay, we're going to start to restore our original conditions. Okay. And so the way we're going to be doing that is we're going to cause, number one, our chromosomes to decondense. Okay. And so initially our chromosomes were condensed into those very thick chromosomes. Okay. Um, now they're going to be decondensed um, during this phase here. The second thing that's going to happen is we're going to break down those mitotic spindles. And when, we, and when we break down those mitotic spindles, that's going to provide the resources to provide uh, the daughter cells cytoskeleton, kind of hold itself and give itself some shape. Okay. And then the third thing that's going to happen is we're going to reform our nuclear envelopes around each set of chromosomes. Okay. So again, here we have one set of chromosomes over here, one set of chromosomes on this side. So we're going to start to reform our nuclear envelopes around each set of chromosomes. So here would be one nuclear envelope. This would be another nuclear envelope. Okay. And so during this phase, uh, we're basically undoing prophase. Everything we did in prophase, we're going to do the exact opposite here. Okay. And that's going to help us to restore our initial conditions. Okay. So at this point in telophase, we still have a single cell in it. We still have a single cell with two nuclei within it. Okay. And each nucleus has um, its own chromosomes within it. So again, this is what it would look like under fluorescence microscopy here. So we'd have one uh, set of chromosomes on one end. We have another set of chromosomes on the other end. Okay. Uh, and then we have our initial cell here. Okay. We still have our, our one single cell surrounding our two nuclei over here. Okay. Okay. So that's telophase. Okay. So that's, that is the mitotic phase. Okay, any questions on the mitotic phase before we get into cytokinesis here? Okay. okay, so if not, so we'll go ahead and get into cytokinesis. So again, at this point, all we've done at this point is we've formed two nuclei within our single cell. Okay, we've replicated our DNA, and now we have two nuclei, one nucleus here and one nucleus here inside of a single cell. So our job is not quite done yet because we need to end up forming two daughter cells. Okay, remember that's the goal, two genetically identical daughter cells. Okay. And so what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna basically end up splitting our cell into two. Okay. We're gonna split it ending up into two, uh, two daughter cells that are gonna be genetically identical. Okay. And so this process of cytokinesis is gonna be where we actually physically separate our cell and split it into two. And this is going to look a little bit different in cells that have a cell wall versus cells that don't. Okay. So we're going to start by looking at cells that do not have a cell wall. And so these would be our animal cells. So, so humans um, and any animals okay, are going to be using this process here. Okay. So in animal cells, cytokinesis is going to begin around um, uh, anaphase. Okay. And so what's going to happen is we're going to take on a different element of the cytoskeleton called actin. Okay. And so actin has the ability to contract. Okay. And so what actin is going to do is it's going to come around um, the metaphase plate, okay, and it's going to form a ring around the metaphase plate. Okay. As it forms that ring, actin is going to con begin to contract and constrict. And when it constricts, it's going to con constrict, 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 until you end up splitting your cell into two. Okay. So here we have our cell. Here we have our uh, actin. Okay. And so when the actin begins to pinch, it creates a little bit of a little groove or a little fissure called the cleavage furrow. Okay. 
So as it begins to pinch and pinch and pinch and pinch, 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 pinch it's going to continue pinching until you end up pinching so much that you split those cells into two. Okay. So pretty easy, straightforward. It's just going to be constricting and constricting and constricting and constricting until eventually you split that cell into two individual components. Okay. Or two daughter cells here. Okay. And then at that point, the cell cycle is done. In plant cells, because they have a cell wall, this is going to be a little bit more complicated. Okay. So plant cells, because they have a cell wall, cannot just form a cleavage furrow. Okay. They can't just pinch the cell in two. The reason for that is the cell wall is too rigid. It's too strong. Okay, remember, it's going to be made up of cellulose, which is a very strong uh, component that's made or a very strong polysaccharide. Okay. So because the cell wall is so rigid and so strong, you can't just split it in two. It's, it's too strong to do that, okay? So instead of forming an, uh, instead of splitting the cell in two, what it'll do um, is instead it'll just form a new cell wall in the middle, okay? In between the two daughter cells, okay? And so here's the way this is going to work. And this is, again, going to be a little bit more complicated than in animal cells, okay? So we're going to kind of rewind back to interface. So if you go back to interface, one of the things that we needed to do was kind of accumulate a bunch of different things. Okay? So what's going to be happening here is the Golgi apparatus is going to start to accumulate lots of enzymes and lots of structural proteins and lots of glucose. And it's going to store them within these vesicles inside the Golgi apparatus. Okay? When prophase hits, we eventually start to break down the Golgi apparatus. Okay? And so when we break down the Golgi apparatus, okay, it's going to basically split apart and the vesicles that contain all of those enzymes, the structural proteins, and the glucose that we accumulated in the interface, all of those vesicles are then going to get moved to the periphery of the cell, and they're just going to chill there until um, they're needed. Okay. So they're just going to stay out of the way, and then they're going to come into play later. Okay. So this is going to be where they make their money. Okay. So when telophase hits, um, all those vesicles that contain the enzymes, structural proteins, and glucose, um, they're going to start to move back to the metaphase plate, okay? Moving along these microtubules here, okay? And so that's what we see here. All these vesicles are gonna move along the metaphase, or along the microtubules, and they're going to line up along the metaphase plate during telophase, okay? Those vesicles are going to end up fusing, okay? And so some of their structural proteins and some of their enzymes uh, are going to start fusing and helping to form a structure called the cell plate. Or we see right here, okay? And then again, that's gonna be due to the vesicles fusing with one another, okay? Um, now, eventually, the cell plate is gonna continue to enlarge and enlarge and enlarge until it actually physically fuses with the cell walls, okay? And so as a result, we end up forming a cell wall in between our two nuclei, okay? So in, instead of splitting the cell into two, like we saw in animal cells, all we're doing is we're just forming a new wall in between those two nuclei. And so the way we get those walls is the enzymes that we accumulated in the Golgi um, are going to take the glucose molecules, and the enzymes are going to take those glucose molecules and end up forming it into cellulose, which will make up the cell wall that we see um, formed here. Okay, so that's that. Um, any questions on this whole process here? Okay, so that's cytokinesis. That's the end of our phase here. So at this point, we have now produced are two genetically identical daughter cells, okay? Any questions before we go forward here? Okay, again, if this makes sense, go ahead and throw a checkpoint or a heart. If it doesn't make sense, if there's something that's confusing, go ahead and throw an X. Okay, so Johanna wants me to go back to the first slide of cytokinesis for a sec, yeah. So the first slide, oh yeah, right here. Okay. Any questions before we go forward here? Okay, so if there's no questions, uh, okay, cool, yeah, no problem, Joanna. Okay, so uh, that is my mitosis. Okay, and so again, um, we're starting with interface. So in interface, we have our cells just go ahead, uh, just going, doing their own thing. Uh, they're going to end up going through G1, S, and G2, where they're going to start to grow. They're going to accumulate their energy stores. 
and then they're going to um, replicate their DNA, okay? And then make sure that they're ready to undergo uh, the mitotic phase, okay? Then we have prophase, where we have our centrosomes, um, and our chromosomes kind of all over the place here. We have metaphase, where our, uh, we have our centrosomes producing their mitotic spindles, and those mitotic spindles are going to arrange the chromosomes along the metaphase plate right here. Okay. In anaphase, we split our chromosomes in two. So we remove or we, we uh, remove the sister chromatids from one another and pull them to opposite ends of the cell. And then in telophase, we undo what we did in prophase. So we're going to reform our nuclear envelope. Um, and then we're going to uh, get rid of our microtubules and then make sure everything is hunky-dory at this point. So in telophase, remember, again, we're still looking at a single cell, but it has two nuclei within it. Then when cytokinesis takes place, we actually physically separate these two cells and split it in half right at this point here. Okay. Cool. So one way that you can kind of help you to remember all these phases of mitosis uh, is kind of by using your hands. And so I learned this technique back in high school and I never forgot it. And so uh, I'll show you guys how to kind of remember everything uh, right now. So um, you take your two hands, maybe your fingertips are going to uh, represent your chromosomes, okay? And then your fingers are going to represent your microtubules, okay? So we're gonna start with prophase, okay? And so in prophase, we have our chromosomes just kind of all over the place, no rhyme or reason to where they are, okay? They're just kind of all over the place, okay? In metaphase, okay, our chromosomes are gonna line up along the metaphase plate. And they're going to be held there by their microtubules. Okay. In anaphase, we're going to separate our chromosomes by their sister chromatids. Okay. Anaphase, we start to reform our nuclei around our chromosomes. And then in cytokinesis, you end up splitting your cell into two. Okay. So again, to kind of run through this again, we have prophase. Okay. Prophase, chromosomes all over the place. Metaphase, we have our uh, chromosomes lined up along the metaphase plate. Anaphase, we've split our chromosomes into the sister chromatids. Telophase, we've reformed our nuclear envelope around our chromosomes. And then cytokinesis. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, again, I used that in high school. I never forgot it um, since freshman year of high school. It's been almost 13 years at this point. I never forgot it. So uh, when the test comes around, uh, you feel free to use this technique to help you remember uh, which phase of mitosis you're looking at. Okay, yeah, no problem. Okay, so that is mitosis. Okay. Um, just let me clear all this out here. Okay, so then last couple things here. Um, so there is one other phase that we haven't really talked about. And so that phase is called the G0 phase. Okay, so this is gonna take place whenever we form a new daughter cell. And so some cells will have a G0 phase, some will not, and it just kind of depends on the type of cell that you're looking at, okay? So when we form a new daughter cell, some of those daughter cells are not going to immediately enter interphase, okay? Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to enter um, a, a, a phase called the G0 phase, okay? So in the G0 phase, the cell is just kind of doing its own thing, and it's not preparing to divide, okay? It's not getting ready to divide. It's just kind of sitting inactive, okay? It's not doing anything. In some cases, um, there are some cells that are going to wait until they get some kind of trigger or some kind of signal okay, that's going to tell it to enter G1, and then from there, it'll enter interface and then go through the whole cell cycle. Okay. Other cells will remain in G0 for their entire lifespan, or they'll never end up dividing. Okay. So examples of that would be cardiac muscle cells. So cardiac muscle cells are never going to divide. So those cells are going to be permanently in G0. They're going to be inactive. They're not going to be preparing to divide because they're not going to divide. Uh, and then nerve cells as well. Okay, so nerve cells will not enter interface. They're not going to be able to replicate. Okay, and so this is why people say, you know, it's very important to take care of your brain and take care of your neurons um, because your nerve cells, if they get damaged, cannot repair themselves. They can't undergo mitosis and they're not going to replicate. So all the neurons that are the nerve cells that you have is all you're ever going to have. And the reason for that is because they never undergo division. They stay in G0 permanently. Um, so those cells will never divide. Okay. Um, so again, some will wait until they get a trigger to enter interface. Some will just remain in G0 for the rest of their lifespan.
Okay. Uh, okay, so we've got a couple of questions here. So this cell is in what phase of mitosis? Okay, so we're looking at early prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, or telophase. Which phase of mitosis are we looking at here? All right. Cool. So I'm seeing a few people get this one. So yeah, so this is anaphase. Perfect. So anaphase, where we have our cells being split, or sorry, our chromosomes being um, split into. Perfect. Um, the next question. So uh, this cell is in which phase of mitosis? This is early prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, or telophase? Yeah, everyone's got this one right. So this is a telophase. Perfect. And again, you can tell because we have our um, chromosomes inside two individual nuclei, but all these or these two nuclei are still within this one overall cell. Okay. And that is that for um, chromosomes. Any questions on mitosis? Any questions at all?